All right, so in this video, I'm going to take a look at momentum and look at Newton's laws and how the two blend together to give you models for solving various problems. So as I do in most videos, let's start off with a couple of definitions that you will need to be able to use as we go through the questions later on. So the first one is an impulse, and that an impulse is just another way of saying a change in momentum of an object. So very often you'll get a question which says an object experiences an impulse of a number, and all that means is the momentum of that object has changed by that amount. It's just the change of momentum. So what is momentum? Well, to calculate an object's momentum, it's the product of its velocity, so that's not the speed, that's the velocity, and its mass. And it's the re because we use the velocity, momentum is a vector property, so it has magnitude and direction. And the final one we're looking at is the resultant force. So when you take into account all the forces acting on the object, it's essentially um, what the overall force is. So once you've ad added all of those different forces together, what's left over, that's the resultant force. If it's in equilibrium, you'll find that that's zero, and sometimes when it's accelerating, you'll find it's not zero. Um, but that's what I mean by a resultant force. Let's have a look at some examples of calculating the resultant force. So this first one is fairly straightforward, because you can see it's only being acted on by this 200 Newton force, there's no other forces, so that means the 200 newtons is the resultant force in that case. And this one here, we've got two forces of 200 newtons acting in exactly opposite directions. Um, so what we have is the resultant force is going to be plus 200. So let's define going to the right as positive, and then it's minus 200, because that's going the opposite direction, so that'll be minus 200. So actually, the resultant force in this one would be zero newtons. Because they cancel each other out, there's no force left on the object. And then, finally, let's have a look at when we've got forces in perpendicular directions. So I showed in an alternative video sort of how you can resolve, resolve forces into perpendicular directions so we can end up with a scenario like this. So how we deal with this, we use a bit of Pythagoras. So what that means is we're going to end up essentially calculating it like this plus to 100 squared now how have we got that? well we have managed that because the first thing you do when you're dealing with vectors is you arrange them tip to tail so we've got the 200 and we've got the 200 so they've got tip to tail right here and then the resultant is essentially Go, taking the shortcut route, if you like, on there, and that's the resultant. We know they're at 90 degrees, so we can apply Pythagoras, and so then what you get in this case, so we can solve to find out what the resultant for, so it's going to be the square root of um, 200 squared, and there's two of them, so it'll be times by 2, and let's grab it. Your calculator, 200 squared times 2, square root of the answer gives you uh, 283 newtons there, uh, given to three significant figures because both of these numbers are giving three significant figures here. Okay, so that's Typically, the scenarios you come across, you might encounter things where you've got forces at an angle, so they're not perpendicular. But how you deal with that is you resolve the angled force into its horizontal and vertical components, add some together if necessary, and then you still use this Pythagoras method. That's my method of dealing with those. So these are the three scenarios you essentially will need to be able to deal with. Okay, so that's resultant force, and uh, we've looked at some definitions. So let's look at Newton's first law. So what I'm going to do with each of these, I'm going to state what the law is, like, I think look, look them up online or in a textbook or whatever, I'm going to sort of like translate it so I explain what they mean and then actually have a think about some examples with those. So Newton's first law is that an object remains at, at rest, so zero, at zero meters per second, uh, not moving, and or in uniform motion, so at constant velocity, 
uh, unless acted on by a resultant force. So things can't change their motion, they can't change their velocity without being acted on by a resultant force. So that's sort of what it means. So let's stop and think about that for a second, because this is often considered Newton's most counterintuitive law. So that means if something's travelling, let's say, at I don't know, 10 metres per second, it will, it will keep going at 10 metres per second forever unless it's acted on by a force. Now, as humans, this makes no sense to us, because we're like in a car, if you take your foot off the accelerator, you slow down. Um, that's because we live in a world where we have friction and air resistance, so we can't have a scenario where there isn't a force acting, if you like. So, actually, that force does act to decrease the velocity. But if there was no friction, there was no air resistance, if you're going at 10 metres per second, you'll go at 10 metres per second in the same direction forever which is pretty crazy when you think about it, but that's what Newton's first law says, and we've never found anything to essentially go against it. That's why we accept the Newton's law that works. Okay, so that's Newton's first law. So let's have a look at some. Newton's second law is uh, probably his most famous law, and uh, you may have even heard of this one already. So the proper definition first, the Rate of change of momentum in an object is directly proportional to the resultant force. Let's translate that. So, rate of change of momentum, um, as long as something has a constant mass, we can just simplify that to say the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the resultant force. And you'll most commonly see this represented in this equation here, F equals MA, which you may have come across before. So, the force is direct proportional to the acceleration, and the constant of proportionality is the mass of the object. Now, the proper way of expressing the whole uh, second law is actually this one, so the change in momentum over change in time. But like I said before, if the mass is constant, we can simplify that to is F equals MA, and that's the form you'll mostly use at this level. Um, so let's have a look at example of putting this into practice. So. We've got an object being acted on by two forces here, and it's got a mass, and we need to calculate the acceleration. The first thing to do is calculate what the resultant force is. So, because as we see in all these laws, it's always talking about the resultant force, and this F here is stands for the resultant force. So the resultant force is going to be uh, 200, because we're going to say that's in the positive direction. It's going to be minus 100 gives you 100 newtons to the right. Now we know that acceleration is the force divided by the mass, that's what we can see from the equation, so it's going to be 100 divided by 2, which is going to be obviously 50, and it's measured in meters per second to the minus 2. So that's your acceleration here. So there are two key stages there. Well, first, work out what the resultant force was. And from the resultant force, you can use Newton's second law to work out your acceleration. Okay, so that's his second law. Then there's the third law. So what the third law says is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, which is, sounds utterly meaningless. So what does that mean? It means that forces always come in pairs. So when a force acts on something, there's always an equal and opposite force coming back, uh, but in the opposite direction. So let me give you some examples. So you, as a human, are standing on planet Earth. Here's my wonderful diagram of a human. You have a weight force, because you know that you have a force from gravity acting towards the centre of the Earth, mg. But you also know that if you stand still, you're not accelerating. If you're not accelerating, that must mean you're in equilibrium, so the resultant force is zero, which must mean there is an equal force acting this way of equal magnitude, so mg, and so those two forces cancel each other out, and you don't end up accelerating uh, anywhere. You'll also come across situations, so uh, say see the most wonderful car I've ever drawn goes that way and then you've got I don't know, I don't say another car going that way in the collision 
they will exert equal and opposite forces on you. So this car will exert a force on that one, and then this one will have an equal and opposite force during the collision. Both of these cars' momentum would change, um, so they'll experience a force, but they'll experience equal and opposite forces. That's Newton's third law. You'll come across quite a few situations in which you'll be putting that into place. Okay, so those are his three laws. He actually has a fourth one, which we'll learn about in year 13, Newton's law of gravitation, um, but we'll leave that to the side at this stage. It's not going to be useful for these topics. Okay. So we've looked at Newton's laws. We've looked at resultant forces. So what we need to do is take a look at momentum. Momentum is quite interesting in that it's kind of like a very mathematical concept in that just multiplying a mass and velocity is how you get momentum. But it's useful because we've discovered that momentum, the total momentum of a system, is always conserved, stays the same, unless it's the system's acted on by a force, which is very interesting and very useful in trying to predict and solve different scenarios. So, let's say our system is made of two balls, like we have in this example below. We calculate the total momentum before they collide. Unless a force externally acts, I don't know, someone else, a third ball comes in and pushes, or someone, a hand comes and shoves them, the total momentum will stay the same, even if they collide with each other. So that's very useful for predicting what will happen following collisions. So let's show you how we put that to use. Um, so what we're looking to do is we're looking to calculate the velocity of this ball here after the collision. Um, and we're going to do that using the principle of conservation of momentum. So the first thing we want to do is calculate the total momentum. And momentum is given the symbol P. And so it's going to be the momentum of the 2 kilogram object plus the momentum of the 1 kilogram object. Now remember, uh, momentum is mass times velocity. I'm just going to abbreviate. It. So essentially what we end up with is the total momentum is the sum of the momentum of the object. Oh, dropped my stylus. It's pretty careless. All right. Uh, so let's sub some numbers in here. So it's going to be 4 times 2. And it's going to be plus 1 times by minus 2. Why minus 2? Because the velocity is to the left of that ball. If to the right is positive, to the left is negative. Um, so be very careful with your signs. So we're going to have 6 minus 2, uh, sorry, 6 minus 2, 8 minus 2, getting ahead of myself there, which gives you 6 uh, Newton seconds. Or you might see it written as kilograms, meters per second. I usually use Newton seconds. Those two uh, units are identical to each other, but Newton seconds is shorter, so that's my preferred unit of momentum. So that's before, that's the total momentum. The total momentum after is going to be exactly the same, so it'll be the momentum of the second one plus momentum of the one kilogram one. So it's going to be uh, two times whatever this is plus. 1 times 1, because they're both going in the same direction now, so it's essentially 1 plus 2 times the question mark. Give it a letter if you want, I usually often call it a V. So this is where we apply the principle of conservation of momentum, we're essentially saying this, total momentum before, is equal to the total momentum after. So what we can do, we know that 1 plus 2 times the question mark is equal to 6 because the total momentum is equal to each other. So then we end up with 6 minus 1 gives you 5, divided by 2 gives you 2.5, and it's the velocity, so it's in meters per second. And we've, So we've actually managed to predict what will happen to these objects following the collision. Now, if you want to take this further, you can look up something called Newton's law of collision. So you can actually predict what will happen to both objects without knowing anything about them. So that's a good way to extend this. And those of you who do um, M2, I think it is further maths, will learn about that as well. Um, but we're not going to go any further into that in this topic here.
Okay, so that's conservation of momentum and how we can put it to use. So the last thing you want to do is actually look at how we can relate an impulse, so the change in momentum of an object, to the force it experienced, because that forces are what cause things to accelerate. So if we can predict the forces they'd experience, we'll know how they will behave. So, as we said before, the impulse is the change in momentum of an object. Now we also know using Newton's second law, the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. It's the change of momentum over the time it occurs. So from that, we can put those two things together and see an impulse is essentially a product of the force and the time over which that force is applied, um, assuming the force is the same throughout. And the most common way you will actually see this is in the form of a force time graph. So you get given one of these and you get asked to find out what the impulse was acting on the object. And the impulse is the area under the graph. So this equation here is essentially indicating that some kind of integration will be used. And if this is something you'll learn about, I think is in C1, integration. Um, so you solve an equation like this where you've got a dt by integrating, which is finding the area under graph. So if you have a force time graph, if we can find this area, no matter what the shape of the graph, we can find what the impulse or the change in momentum of an object was, which is a very useful thing to be able to do. Um, so if we take a look at the first example, this is a square. Um, so essentially we know the impulse is going to be whatever the force was, so that, that F, we know however long it acted for, it's going to be FT, so it's nice and simple. This one is a triangle, and you should know it, the area of a triangle half base times height. So if again we just call that F and we call that T, the impulse in this case is going to be half times the base times the height. So essentially half FT in this case. So depending on what shape your graph is, you might get some slightly more complicated things you have to approximate, but impulse, area under force time graph fairly straightforward. Okay, so let's have a look at an example of the type of thing you'd get. So a stationary object, so it has zero momentum to start with, is acted on by an average force of 5 newtons for 3 seconds. Calculate the velocity... Calculate the velocity of the object's velocity? What on earth? But, uh, let's, let's correct that to start with. Let's get rid of that. That doesn't make... Let's calculate the velocity of the object after the force has been applied. What, what's going on? Anyway, the first thing is to sketch a graph. Force time. Now, it just says it's been acted on by an average force of 5 newtons. So we don't know what the actual force is, so let's just say the force has been pretty crazy uh, for that time. But it's told us that the average force over that time is 5 so essentially what we've got here, uh, it acted for three seconds. So what is essentially formed is a rectangle like this. So no matter what the original force was doing, we know it's at an average of five for that time. So essentially it's a rectangle. So we know that the impulse is just going to be Ft in this case. So it's just going to be five times by three. So it gives you 1.5 times 10 to the 1 uh, newton seconds, the unit of impulse. Why haven't I written 15? These are both one significant figure numbers, people. Uh, so let's give it some standard form. Yeah, I could write 15, but I prefer standard form, and I use it as much as I can. I advise you to do the same. Use some standard form. Okay, um, so that's the end of this video. I hope you found that informative. And on the next video, I'm going to move on and look at some principles of energy as well, because that's something else that's conserved in the whole, like every system in the universe.